so hello everyone. Uh, my name is Zach. I'm an engineer at Google. Um, I work on Gmail, Chat, and Meet. Uh, today I'm going to do an introductory talk to uh, Dagger and Hilt um, and why we strongly recommend investing in it. Um, I'll also give some examples on how you can, how Hilt can simplify your existing Dagger integration and keep you focused on just writing great applications. Um, at Google, we use Hilt for a few things. Um, it speeds up our development time. Um, it also simplifies em employee onboarding with Dagger. Um, we found that when using Dagger, there's a high learning curve. Um, and when we used Hilt, we were able to eliminate a lot of that. Um, and then lastly, it lets us design features in isolation um, without shipping them into production until they're ready. So we're able to, a lot of times, use Dagger to make things optional until they're actually in production. So uh, just a quick overview of what we're going to talk about today. Um, I'm going to go over some. Uh, I'm going to go over what is dependency injection. We're going to talk about some core uh, Dagger concepts. We'll go over components, modules, scopes, um, and then we'll dive into Hilt. So with Hilt, we'll also talk about what is Hilt, what are Android entry points, um, what is the install-in uh, portion of Hilt. We'll talk a little bit about the component hierarchy that Hilt provides for you. And then we'll also talk briefly about tests. Um, so what is dependency injection? Um, I think this is an important thing to get started with. And when I was working on this talk, I had a really hard time trying to figure out how to simply explain this to someone that knew nothing about dependency injection. But there was one quote that uh, really stuck with me which is uh, dependency injection is the process of making a class independent of its dependencies. So some people might hear that and think, OK, that makes sense. But I'm willing to bet a lot of people are going to hear that and think, I have no idea what you just said, Zach. That makes no sense to me at all. Um, and don't worry. Um, we're going to dive into some examples to try to make this uh, a little easier to understand. So if we were to um, start with a simple example, a lot of you probably have something like this in your application currently. You might have an image cache. Um, the internals of this class don't matter for the purpose of this talk. I'm just showing the constructor because that's all that matters. Um, the other important thing is uh, there's a network API. Internals of that also don't matter. The only thing you need to know is the network API is an interface. Um, so I want to make sure we're all on the same page about that, how that class is set up, and, and how it generally works. If we were to take this a little bit further, um, we can see that there's some things on here that you may or may not be familiar with. There's an add inject annotation. Um, this is um, an instruction to Dagger, or any dependency injection library, that the dependency injection library should handle creating this object. Um, in terms of like verbiage, um, I also use uh, inject a lot of times uh, throughout this talk to be the action of providing something. So the action of providing something is injecting. Um, another common term that you'll hear in this talk is binding. Um, binding is going to be what our network API is. So that interface is um, something that is provided in an object that's injected. Um, if you work with Dagger a lot, you'll probably see a very common error message that says unable to provide binding or duplicate binding. It's very confusing. But what it means is, is that some dependency in your object is either being provided multiple ways, which is confusing Dagger, or what it means is, is that um, it doesn't know how to construct that object. So in this case, network API is an interface. Dagger's not going to be able to construct an interface. Interface is not something you can actually create. So you'll have to give instructions to Dagger later on to tell it how to create that object when you ask for it. Um, if we were dealing with a fully fleshed out app, um, we, another thing with image cache that you may not think about with dependency injection is that dependency injection also inc um, will include this, the life cycle of something. 
So if you had an image cache, you don't want to have multiple instances of it. That defeats the purpose of having a cache. You want to have one instance uh, realistically. And so dependency injection can help you with that um, through, the uses, uh, through the use of scopes. So scopes are things that you're going to actually write and provide to Dagger, but they'll tell Dagger how long to keep an object around for. So in this case, we would probably want to use the singleton scope or application scope, which basically says keep one image cache for the life cycle of our entire application. Um, and so then this also dives into the next point, which is like, how is this actually useful? Um, this might be a simple example that um, some of you may work with today. Um, you might have an adapter that renders some items on a home feed. Um, in there, you might have a view holder. That view holder might take the image cache to load something. Now, this adapter doesn't actually care about the image cache, right? It's just the view holder that actually needs it. So if you're not using dependency injection, every time you refactor a class, you're going to start passing these extra classes around everywhere. And that's probably not something you actually want to do. It's sort of like you know, a small change leads into a massive refactor where you have to touch 50 different classes to pass this new dependency around. Um, dependency injection uh, makes that a little simpler. Um, if we were to change this over to um, do something with dependency injection, you would actually see something like this, um, which is basically uh, the only thing your adapter needs is a factory for creating your view holders. It doesn't care about the image cache. So if we go back to that quote I had earlier, where it's about uh, making objects independent of their dependencies, is now what we've done is we've made this view holder's internal dependencies, the image cache, independent of actually providing it in the adapter. The adapter no longer knows about that. Um, and that's great, because now we don't need to update all these classes when we make small changes. And so um, if we dive into like the next part of this talk, it's really, what is Dagger? Um, so we've talked kind of at a high level about dependency injection itself. Um, but Dagger is a specific library for providing dependency injection. There are multiple libraries. Um, but Dagger is really favored on mobile, um, partially because of its performance. Um, everything happens at compile time. So for the most part, um, you're not going to run into any issues during runtime or doing anything with reflection. Um, that makes things great, because you don't want to do that on mobile at all. Um, and then there are some basics with uh, Dagger that we'll dive into here. Um, so when you work with Dagger, you don't have like an actual library class that you talk to. You'll have a list of annotations. And these annotations are instructions to Dagger for what classes to generate at compile time. Um, there's a lot. I'm not going to cover all of them in this talk. Um, but these are the basics that I think you really need to understand if you want to start working with Dagger. Um, you'll see component, module, uh, inject, and scope. Um, we'll go over each of these in the next couple slides. And I think these are really crucial to understand, even if you're going to use uh, Hilt later on. Um, the first one that we'll end up talking about is inject. Um, so um, there are two types of injection. There is constructor injection, and there's field injection. Um, I've only shown examples so far using constructor injection. Um, so we'll dive into that example first. Um, you saw that in our previous example, where we just put add inject in front of the constructor. This is the simplest way to do injection. Everything's provided when the object's created. Um, and really, what you're telling Dagger in this case is you're saying, hey, um, I want you to write all the code for creating this object whenever I ask for it. Um, behind the scenes, if you uh, want to understand some of the fundamentals, Dagger will actually write a module for you, so you don't have to write it. Um, so this is the preferred approach. It's really simple. Um, but you're telling Dagger that every object in here, you should be able to figure out and provide for me. I'm not going to write any more code for providing this. If we wanted to refactor this class to use field injection, um, you might see something like this. Um, and so. The thing with field injection uh, that isn't always immediately uh, obvious is that when this object is created, network API uh, is null. And Kotlin does a better job of this than Java, um, because you have the latent init uh, modifier, which you'll see. Um, but this is problematic, because when you create this object, you're in this halfway state. 
The image cache is null, all your dependencies are null, but the object itself is created. Um, and so you might be wondering, like, if these two examples exist, why do we have two ways of doing things if one's preferred and the other one's not? Well, in Android, sadly, not every object that you create is owned uh, by your code base. Um, fragments, activities, services, um, you're not going to create those objects, right? The framework's going to do it for you. So when you work with fragments or activities, you're going to have to do field injection. It's the only way to really get it done. There are some ways that are more recent where you can write factories to do this for you, but I guarantee everyone in this room that their min API version is not high enough for that to be possible. Um, I also want to um, add emphasis to this because we see this a lot at Google with people who are new to Dagger is they'll just randomly switch between constructor injection and field injection and expect things to work. Um, Dagger's not doing any reflection here. It's not going to figure out that it needs to set these fields just because you create this object. Um, and to show a, a little bit further of this example, there's a second step that you would have to do um, where you'd have to create the image cache You'd have to find your component, and then you'd have to pass the image cache to it. Once you do that, it would set all the fields for you. Um, and so that really covers injection. Um, I think the, the next big point is to sort of talk about components. Um, so components primarily do two things. Um, they work as factories for creating new objects. Um, so for here, we have one called our application component. Um, and we were saying that it should be responsible for actually creating our image cache. At compile time, Dagger will create a class, uh, roughly named something like Dagger Application Component. It will just append Dagger to the front. Um, that's the actual implementation that will try to implement this interface. So if you put random methods on your interface for components, um, whatever those interface objects return, Dagger will actually try to create those objects try to create an interface implementation that returns that object if it knows how to create it. The other thing that uh, components do is they control the life cycle. So when you scope something, you're actually retaining it inside the component. Uh, scoped objects don't exist in the ether. They have to actually be attached to a component. So if you throw away your component, you don't retain it somewhere, like on an application or an activity, you're going to lose your scoped object with it. Um, you can sort of think of components like giant factories. They just produce your objects for you. Um, you also notice with this that there is this uh, module annotation uh, that I'm using next to the uh, component annotation uh, where I throw in the network module. Um, we talked earlier with our image cache where network API was an interface. Remember, you can't construct interfaces. So what we do here is um, we have to now give instructions to Dagger that when I ask for network API, um, I want you to give me something specific. That's what a module will do. And that sort of dives into the next part of our talk, um, which really talks about uh, modules. Um, so this is the simplest way to provide a module. You can have your implementation. You can use binds. And you can tell Dagger, hey, anytime I ask for network API, um, give me network API implementation. Um, this is great because um, it makes it so that any consumers of your network API don't actually care about the implementation value. You can easily swap this out in tests, for instance, and uh, no one has to be aware of it, as long as your interface um, is set up correctly to handle everything you want. Um, another important thing here um, to kind of take note for now, because it's going to come up later, is you'll notice that um, with the component, um, we're telling it what modules uh, we want, and you'll have to give it a list of modules. That's going to be reversed when we get to Hill. Um, and so here you can see an example. Maybe in you know in test environments, you don't want to actually really use network, so you can provide a fake network implementation that you can just verify that results are called and stuff like that, and have everything uh, work the same with minimal changes. Um, the the last really important thing is uh, going to be scopes. Um, We've covered ways to sort of get our, our components and how to uh, give Dagger instructions, but I haven't really shown you how to tell Dagger that it should retain something. Um, you'll do that with a scope. Um, scopes are annotations uh, that you'll create 
um, and apply to components. When you, comply a scope, when you apply a, a scope to a component, you're telling that component that um, it should retain anything that has a matching scope. Um, Singleton is the one that you'll commonly see. That's, there's nothing special about it. It's just that comes in Java for free. Um, so a lot of people will put Singleton on their application component because you only have one application. Um, if we go back into our image cache example, if we want to make sure that there's only one instance of it, um, we would put Singleton on top of the application component, and then we would later on um, do the same thing for our image cache itself. So um, that will actually, at this point, tell Dagger that, hey, every time I ask for image cache, give me the singleton instance of it. Um, and then that will make it as long as you retain your application component, so you only ever have one instance. You can do the same thing for fragments or activities. If you want something to live for the life cycle of an activity or a fragment, you could create your own custom annotation for fragment scope or activity scope. Um, as you see an example here, and you could do the same thing. It wouldn't make sense probably to have your image cache uh, attached to the lifecycle of your activity, but just for the purpose of an example, you can see. Um, so that really talks about Dagger. Um, I think the next point is to sort of dive into Hilt. Um, so I've shown you a lot of the sort of building blocks that Dagger itself gives you. Well, Hilt's really great because Hilt sort of works further on that. Um, Dagger is not Android specific. There are backend teams that use it at Google and other various different uh, places that you can actually apply it. Um, but Hilt actually is Android specific. And so that's great because it allows it to be really opinionated on how things should work. Um, so if you've worked in a couple different application code bases where people use Dagger, one of the things that you'll see is a lot of repetition. Everybody creates an application component. Most people create an activity component. Most people create a fragment component and so on. Um, Hilt provides all these out of the box. You don't have to define or set them up. Um, so that really simplifies uh, your initial setup with using uh, dependency injection. Um, Hilt also uh, does some great work when you work with um, activities and fragments by making it really simple to do field injection without having to worry about it. We'll dive into that a little bit later, though. Um, and so just like before, Hilt comes with its own set of annotations that you'll commonly see. There's a little bit more than this, but I don't think it's useful in this talk to dive too low level into everything. Um, but the most common ones you'll see is Android Entry Point. You'll see Install In, and you'll see Hilt Android Test. Um, so the first one that we're going to talk about is Android Entry Point. So if we had our fragment that we had before, and we want to do field injection, so we want to actually put our image cache in this fragment. Um, we could write something like this. This actually won't do anything. Our image cache will be null uh, when we create our fragment. So um, what you would actually have to do if you weren't using Hilt is you'd have to write a bunch of uh, basically boiler, boilerplate code. So you would have to write a component for your fragment. You would then need to add a method on your component to actually inject that fragment. And then when your fragment's created, you would need to try to find this component. You probably would store it on your activity, and you'd have to do a bunch of casting. And then you'd have to actually inject it. Um, so uh, we don't want to do all that, uh, because that's kind of a lot of boilerplate, right? Um, and so this is all you have to do with Hill. Um, you'll notice the only difference that we've done here is, is that we just added at Android Entry Point. Um, Hilt now is going to do everything for you. It's going to make everything injected when the fragment's created. And it's actually going to do this by doing some bytecode manipulation if you're using Gradle, where it will rewrite your fragment on attach method to actually do this for you. Um, also, the reason, if you're wondering why it says Android entry point, is you can view it as the entry point into the component graph. That's kind of where they're going with that. And then they just depend to Android because it's Android specific. Um, you'll also see that there is like entry points that you can write. Um, we're not going to talk about those too much, um, but you can also dive into those a little bit. All right, so the next big thing is installing. Um, you remember before where we had our component and we had to give our, our modules that we wanted to install into it? It looks something like this. Um, this actually ends up being sort of cumbersome if you have a big application and you want to swap those modules out. Like maybe, you know, in tests, you want to switch to a test networking module. 
Well, that's really hard because now you have to write a separate application component that has the separate list of modules that you would want for tests. Uh, and it's just a lot of extra stuff to keep going. So Hilt sort of flips things and makes them reverse. Um, instead of having this network module put at the end here, you actually tell your module where it should be installed instead. Um, so as long as this module is included in your build target um, at compile time, uh, your component will go and grab everything that is trying to be installed. Um, so this is great. It makes it a lot easier to sort of like set up your test environments differently without having to rewrite your components uh, for each environment. Uh, and I think this inverse, just in general, like, is a little bit easier to work with. Um, but you may have some questions here. Um, you know, why do they pick Singleton uh, component? Uh, that's one of the ones that Hilt gives you for free. Um, so you, that actually maps to your application's lifecycle. So as long as you have one instance of your application, anything that's installed in Singleton component will be the same. Um, you may be wondering, like, well, what other components does Hilt provide me? Uh, these are uh, sort of the main list of them. Um, you'll see singleton component, activity retained component, activity component, fragment component, so on. Um, there's even some stuff for view models and services, depending on what you want to use. Um, it's really important to understand that these also work in a hierarchy. Um, so anything that is in the top can be injected all the way down. So if something's in your singleton component, it's pretty much available universally. Um, but if something's in your fragment component, you're not going to be able to inject it in your activity component. I mean, that doesn't make sense, right? Um, and so that's one of the things that this hierarchy tries to do is it also helps you sort of prevent uh, creating memory leaks and other things. If you set up your uh, hierarchy correct, if you set up your scoping correctly, you don't really have to worry about it. Um, it also has its own scopes for every component. So you don't have to create your own scopes anymore. You can create one for, uh, there's fragment scope, activity scope, activity retained scope, so on. And then uh, one last thing that I'm going to talk about today is uh, tests. So you'll see this annotation at Hilt Android test. You'll apply this to your JUnit tests. What does this actually do is this will create an application for your test itself. Um, and it will allow injection to happen inside the test. So you can inject whatever bindings you want in your application universally, access them in your test without having to create them. Um, at Google, we think this has been really helpful in us catching bugs because we actually don't create any of our objects in tests. We inject everything. Um, so we use the same executors that we use in production, or the same thread pools. We use most of the same uh, bindings as much as we can. There are some things we have to mock out, like networking and stuff like that. Um, but it actually helps us catch things like race conditions and other things that when we weren't using injection, a lot of times people would make things single-threaded. Uh, and then we would completely miss uh, race conditions and stuff like that. And your tests just aren't as useful. Um, so I, I, I really recommend, if you're going to adopt Hilt, that you actually eventually try to adopt using Hilt in test too. If, it, it's sort of optional. You don't have to do both. But I think you're missing out on like a really big win uh, by also implementing this. Um, if we were to use our previous example too, um, it would look something like this, where you would just write your Hilt Android rule, you put the annotation on top, and then everything's injectable. Um, one other thing that this forces you to do, if you want to get something that is fragment scoped or activity scoped, you need to create a fragment or an activity in your test, which um, some people don't like doing because it's extra work. But that's, that's how those objects work in production, right? They're created with activities. They're created with fragments. Your test should try to do the same thing. If you're using something like RoboElectric, this is really easy to do. It has a great uh, mocking layer to make this possible. Um, and then that is pretty much it. Um, there is, I guess, questions will be outside uh, here in a little bit. If you have any questions you want to ask me or if you're curious about anything with Dagger, um, feel free to come and talk to me. Right. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>